Chapter Sixteen of Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Sixteen, Ingua's New Dress. Well, said Mary Louise when Josie had related to her friend the story next morning. What do you think of Old Swallowtail now? About the same as before. I'm gradually accumulating facts to account for the old man's strange actions, but I'm not ready to submit to them for criticism just yet. The plot is still a bit ragged, and I want to mend the holes before I spread it out before you. Do you think he suspects who you are? No, he thinks I'm away from the city with a penchant for burglary. He expects me to rob you presently and then run away. I'm so unlikely to cross his path again that he talked with unusual frankness, to me, or at me, if you prefer to put it that way. All I gained last night was the knowledge that he's afraid of himself, that his temper cost him a career in the world and obliged him to live in seclusion, and that he has a secret which he doesn't intend any red-headed girl to stumble on accidentally. And you think he was angry when you accused him of neglecting Ingua? I'm sure he was. It made him more furious than my attempt to saw his padlock. Come, let's run over and see Ingua now. I want to ask her how her grandfather treated her this morning. They walked through the grounds, crossed the river on the stepping stones, and found Ingua just finishing her morning's work. The child greeted them eagerly. I'm glad you come, she said, for I was meaning to run over to your place pretty soon. What do you think has happened? Last night in the middle of the night, or perhaps near a morning, Grandad begun to slam things around. The smashing of tables and chairs woke me up, but I didn't dare go down to see what was the matter. He tumbled everything round the kitchen and then went into his own room and made the fur fly there. I knew he were in one of his tantrums and that he'd be sorry if he broke things, but it wasn't no time to interfere. When the rumpus stopped I went to sleep again, but I got up early and had his breakfast all ready when he came from his room. I picked up all the stuff he'd scattered and mended a broken chair, and things didn't look so bad. Well, old Swallowtail just looked around the room and then at me and sat down to eat. Ingua, he says pretty soon, you need a new dress. Say, girls, I near fell over backwards. Go down to Saul Jerram, says he, and pick out the goods and I'll pay for it. I'll stop in this morning and tell Saul to let you have it. And, says he, looking at me rather queer, you might ask that red-headed sewing girl that's staying in at the Hathaways to make it up for you. I don't think she'll ask you a cent for the work. Grandad, says I, would you have a crack except charity, even to the making of a dress? No, says he, the girl owes me something and I guess she'll be glad to square the account. Then he goes away to town and I've been nervous and flustered ever since. I can't make it out. I can't. Do you owe him anything, Josie? Yes, said Josie with a laugh. I believe I do. You shall have the dress, Ingua, all made up, and I'll go down with you and help pick out the goods. So will I, exclaimed Mary Louise, highly delighted. And we will have Miss Huckins cut it and fit it, continued Josie. I'm not much good at that thing, Ingua, so we will have a real dressmaker, and I'll pay her and charge it up to what I owe your grandfather. The little girl seemed puzzled. "'How do you happen to owe him anything, Josie?' she asked. "'Didn't he tell you?' "'Not a word. "'Then he expects it to remain a secret, and you mustn't urge me to tell. "'I'm pretty good at keeping secrets, Ingua. "'Aren't you glad of that?' "'They trooped away to town presently, all in high spirits, "'and purchased the dress and trimmings at the store. "'Old Saul was so astonished at this transaction "'that he assailed the three girls with a thousand questions, "'to none of which did he receive a satisfactory reply.' He didn't put no limit on the deal, said the storekeeper. He just said, whatever the gal picks out, charge it to me and I'll pay the bill. Looks like old Swallertail had gone plum crazy, don't it? Then they went upstairs to Miss Huckins, who was likewise thrilled with excitement at the startling event of Ingua's having a new dress. Mary Louise and Josie helped plan the dress, which was to be a simple and practical affair, after all, and the dressmaker measured the child carefully and promised her a fitting the very next day. "'I don't quite understand,' remarked Ingua, as they walked home after this impressive ceremony. "'Why, you don't make the dress yourself, Josie, and save your money. You're a dressmaker, you say?' "'I'm a sewing girl,' replied Josie calmly. "'But I promised Mary Louise to sew for no one but her while I'm here, and I'm too lazy to sew much anyway. I'm having a sort of vacation, you know.' "'Josie is my friend,' explained Mary Louise, "'and I won't let her sew at all if I can help it.' I want her to be just my companion and have a nice visit before she goes back to the city. But when the two girls were alone, Josie said to Mary Louise, Old Cragg isn't so stony-hearted after all. Just my suggestion last night that Ingwa was being neglected has resulted in a new dress. 
"'He threw things, though, before he made up his mind to be generous,' observed Mary Louise. "'But this proves that the old man isn't so very poor. He must have a little money, Josie.' Josie nodded her hat absently. She was trying hard to understand Mr. Cragg's character, and so far it baffled her. He had frankly admitted his ungovernable temper, and had deplored it. Also he had refrained from having Josie arrested for burglary, because he was too occupied to prosecute her. Occupied? Occupied with what? Surely not the real estate business. She believed the true reason for her escape was that he dreaded prominence. Old Swallowtail did not wish to become mixed up with police courts any more than he could help. This very occurrence made her doubt him more than ever. End of chapter 16. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 17 of Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 17. A Clue at Last. That night Josie resumed her watch of Cragg's cottage. She did not trust to the shadow of the tree to conceal her, but hid herself under the bank of the river, among the dry stones, allowing only her head to project above the embankment, and selecting a place where she could peer through some low bushes. She suspected that the excitement of the previous night might render the old man nervous and wakeful, and send him out on one of his midnight prowls. This suspicion seemed justified when, at eleven-thirty, his light went out, and a few minutes later he turned the corner of the house and appeared in the path. He did not seem nervous, however. With hands clasped behind his back and head bowed, he leisurely paced the path to the bridge, without hesitation, crossed the river, and proceeded along the road in a direction opposite to the village. Josie was following, keeping herself concealed with utmost care. She remembered that his eyes were sharp in penetrating shadows. He kept along the main country road for a time, and then turned to the right and followed an intersecting road. Half a mile in this direction brought him to a lane running between two farm tracks, but which was so little used that grass and weeds had nearly obliterated all traces of wagon-wheels. By this time Josie's eyes were so accustomed to the dim moonlight that she could see distinctly some distance ahead of her. The sky was clear, there was just enough wind to rattle the leaves of the trees. Now and then, in some farmyard, a cock would crow or a dog bark, but no other sounds broke the stillness of the night. The girl knew now where old Swallowtail was bound. At the end of this lane lay his five acres of stones, and he was about to visit it. The fact gave her a queer little thrill of the heart, for a dozen strange fancies crossed her mind in rapid succession. If he had really killed Ned Jocelyn, it was probable he had buried the man in this neglected place, among the rubble of stones. Josie had inspected every foot of ground on the Kenton place, and satisfied herself no grave had been dug there. Indeed, at the time of Jocelyn's disappearance, the ground had been frozen so hard that the old man could not have dug a grave. Perhaps after a night or two he had dragged the corpse here and covered it with stones it would be a safe hiding-place. And now regret for his act drove the murderer here night after night to watch over the secret grave. Or, granting that the supposed crime had not been committed, might not Mr. Cragg have discovered some sort of mineral wealth in his stone-yard, which would account for his paying taxes on the place, and visiting it so often? Or did he simply love the solitude of the dreary waste, where, safe from prying eyes, he could sit among the rocky boulders and commune with himself beneath the moonlight sky? Such conjectures as these occupied the girl's mind while she stealthily shadowed the old man along the lane. Never once did he look behind him, although she was prepared to dissolve from view instantly, had he done so. And at last the end of the lane was reached, and he climbed the rail-fence which separated it from the valley of stones. Josie saw him pause, motionless, as he clung to the rails. She guessed from his attitude that he was staring straight ahead of him at something that had surprised him. A full minute he remained thus before he let himself down on the other side, and disappeared from view. The girl ran lightly forward, and crouching low, peered through the bars of the fence. Half a dozen paces distant the old man stood among the stones in a silent paroxysm of rage. He waved his long arms in the air, anon clenching his fists and shaking them at some object beyond him. His frail old body fluttered back and forth, right and left, as if he were doing a weird dance among the rocks. The violence of his emotion was something terrible to witness, and fairly startled the girl. Had he screamed or sobbed or shrieked or moaned, the scene would have been more bearable, 
but such excess of silent, intense rage made her afraid for the first time in her life. She wanted to run away. At one time she actually turned to fly, but then common sense came to her rescue, and she resolved to stay and discover what had affected old Swallowtail so strongly. From her present position she could see nothing more than a vista of tumbled stones, but rising until her head projected above the topmost rail, she presently saw, far across the valley, an automobile, standing silhouetted against the grey background. The machine was at present vacant. It had been driven in from the other side of the valley, where doubtless there were other lanes corresponding with the one she was in. However, there was no fence on that side to separate the lane from the waste tract, so the machine had been driven as close as possible to the edge of the stones. Although the automobile was deserted, that was evidently the object which had aroused old Cragg's fury, the object at which he was even yet shaking his clenched fists. Josie wondered and watched. Gradually the paroxysm of wrath diminished. Presently the old man stood as motionless as the stones about him. Five minutes, perhaps, he remained thus, controlling himself by a mighty effort, regaining his capacity to think and reason. Then, to the girl's amazement, he tottered toward a large, shelf-like slab of stone, and kneeling down, as before an altar, he bared his head, raised his arms on high, and began to pray. There was no mistaking this attitude— Old Swallowtail was calling on God to support him in his hour of trial. Josie felt something clutching at her heart. Nothing could be more impressive than this scene, this silent but earnest appeal to the Most High by the man whom she suspected of murder, of crimes even more terrible. She could see his eyes, pleading and sincere, turned upward. She could see his grey hair flutter in the breeze, could see his lips move, though they uttered no sound. And after he had poured out his heart to his Maker he extended his arms upon the slab, rested his head upon them, and again became motionless. The girl waited. She was sorely troubled, surprised, even humiliated at being the witness of this extraordinary and varied display of emotion. She felt a sense of intrusion that was almost unjustifiable, even in a detective. What right had any one to spy upon a communion between God and man? He rose at length, rose and walked uncertainly forward, stumbling among the ragged rocks. He made for the far hillside that was cluttered with huge fragments of stone, some weighing many tons, and all tumbled helter-skelter, as if aimlessly tossed there by some giant hand. And when he reached the place he threaded his way between several great boulders and suddenly disappeared. Josie hesitated a moment what to do, yet instinct urged her to follow. She had a feeling that she was on the verge of an important discovery, that events were about to happen which had been wholly unforeseen, even by old Cragg himself. She was taking a serious risk by venturing on the stony ground, for under the moonlight her dark form would show distinctly against the dull grey of the stones. Yet she climbed the fence, and with her eye fixed on the cluster of rocks where old Swallowtail had disappeared, she made her way as best she could toward the place. Should the old man reappear, or the owner of the strange automobile emerge from the rocks, Josie was sure to be discovered, and there was no telling what penalty she might be obliged to pay for spying. It was a dreary, deserted place— more than one grave might be made there without much chance of detection. In a few minutes she had reached the hillside and was among the great boulders. She passed between the same ones where Mr. Cragg had disappeared, but found so many set here and there that to follow his trail was impossible, unless chance led her aright. There were no paths, for a rubble of small stones covered the ground everywhere. Between some of the huge rocks the passage was so narrow she could scarcely squeeze through, between others there was ample space for two people to walk abreast. The girl paused frequently to listen, taking care the while to make no sound herself, but an intense silence pervaded the place. After wandering here and there for a time without result, she had started to return to the entrance of this labyrinth, when her ears for the first time caught a sound, a peculiar grinding, thumping sound that came from beneath her feet seemingly, and was of so unusual a character that she was puzzled to explain its cause. The shadows cast by the towering rocks rendered this place quite dark, so Josie crouched in the deepest shade she could find, and listened carefully to the strange sound, trying to determine its origin. It was surely underground, a little to the right of her, perhaps beneath the hillside, which slanted abruptly from this spot. She decided there must be some secret passage that led to a cave under the hill. Such a cave might be either natural or artificial. In either case she was sure old Cragg used it as a rendezvous or workshop, and visited it stealthily on his wakeful nights. 
Having located the place to the best of her ability, Josie began to consider what caused that regular thumping noise, which still continued without intermission. "'I think it must be some sort of engine,' she reflected, "'a stamp for ore, or something of that sort. Still, it isn't likely there is any steam or electrical power to operate the motor of so big a machine. It must be a die stamp, though, operated by foot power, or, this is most likely, a foot power printing press.' "'Well, if a die stamp or a printing press, I believe the mystery of old Swallowtail's business is readily explained.' She sat still there, crouching between the rocks, for more than two hours before the sound of the machine finally ceased. Another hour passed in absolute silence. She ventured to flash her pocket searchlight upon the dial of her watch, and found it was nearly four o'clock. Dawn would come presently, and then her situation would be more precarious than ever.' While she thus reflected the sound of footsteps reached her ears, very near to her indeed, and then a voice muttered, "'Come this way. Have you forgotten?' "'Forgotten? I found the place, didn't I?' was the surly reply. Then there passed her, so closely that she could have touched them, three dim forms. She watched them go and promptly followed, taking the chance of discovery if they looked behind. They were wholly unconscious of her presence, however, and soon made their way out into the open." There they paused, and Josie, hiding behind a high rock, could both see and hear them plainly. One was old Cragg, another, a tall, thin man with a monocle in his left eye. The third, she found to her surprise, was none other than Jim Bennett, the postman. The tall man held in his arms a heavy bundle, securely wrapped. "'You'll surely get them off to-morrow,' said Cragg to him. "'Of course,' was the answer. "'You may be certain I'll not have them on my hands longer than is necessary.' "'Do you mean to play square this time?' "'Don't be a fool,' said the tall man impatiently. "'Your infernal suspicions have caused trouble enough during the past year. Hidden like a crab in your shell, you think everything on the outside is going wrong. Can't you realize, Cragg, that I must be loyal to C.I.L.? There is no question of my playing square. I've got to.' "'That's right, sir,' broke in Jim Bennett. "'Seems to me he has explained everything in a satisfactory manner, as far as anyone could explain.' "'Then good night,' said Cragg gruffly, "'and good luck.' "'Good night.' growled the tall man in return, and made off in the direction of the automobile, carrying the package with him. The other two stood silently watching him until he reached the car, took his seat, and started the motor. Presently the machine passed out of sight, and then Bennett said, in a tone of deepest respect, "'Good night, Chief. This meeting was a great thing for C.I.L. It brings us all nearer to final success.' "'I wish I could trust him,' replied Cragg doubtfully. "'Good night, Jim.' The postman made off in another direction, and the old man waited until he had fully disappeared, before he walked away over the stones himself. Josie let him go. She did not care to follow him home. Weary though she was from her long vigil, she determined to examine the rocks by daylight before she left the place. The sun was just showing its rim over the hills when she quitted Hezekiah Cragg's five acres of stone, and took the lane to the highway. But her step was elastic, her eyes bright, her face smiling. I found the entrance, though I couldn't break in, she proudly murmured, but a little dynamite, or perhaps a few blows of an axe, will soon remove the barrier. This affair, however, is now too big and too serious for me to handle alone. I must have help. I think it will amaze dear old Dad to know what I've stumbled on this night. End of chapter 17. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 18. Doubts and Suspicions. Mary Louise entered her friend's room at seven o'clock and exclaimed, Not up yet? Josie raised her head drowsily from the pillow. Let me sleep till noon, she pleaded. I've been out all night. And did you learn anything? was the eager question. Please let me sleep. Shall I send you up some breakfast, Josie? Breakfast. Bah! She rolled over, drawing the clothes about her, and Mary Louise softly left the darkened room and went down to breakfast. "'Grandpa Jim,' she said, thoughtfully buttering her toast, "'do you think it's right for Josie to be wandering around in the dead of night?' He gave her an odd look and smiled. "'If I remember aright, it was one Miss Mary Louise Burroughs who thrust Josie into this vortex of mystery. You didn't answer my question, Grandpa Jim. I can imagine no harm, to girl or man, in being abroad in this peaceful country at night— if one has the nerve to undertake it. You and I, dear, prefer our beds. 
Josie is wrapped up in the science of criminal investigation, and has the enthusiasm of youth to egg her on. Moreover, she is sensible enough to know what is best for her. I do not think we need to worry over her nightly wanderings, which doubtless have an object. Has she made any important discovery as yet? I believe not, said Mary Louise. She has learned enough to be positive that old Mr. Cragg is engaged in some secret occupation of an illegal character, but so far she is unable to determine what it is. He's a very queer old man, it seems, but shrewd and clever enough to keep his secret to himself. And how about the disappearance of Mr. Jocelyn? We're divided in opinion about that, said the girl. Ingua and I both believe Mr. Cragg murdered him, but Josie isn't sure of it. If he did, however, Josie thinks we will find the poor man's grave somewhere under the stones of the river bed. There was no grave dug on our grounds, that is certain. Colonel Hathaway regarded her seriously. I am sorry, Mary Louise, he remarked, that we ever decided to mix in this affair. I did not realize when first you proposed having Josie here that the thing might become so tragic. It has developed under investigation, you see, she replied. But I am not very sure of Josie's ability, because she is not very sure of it herself. She dare not, even yet, advance a positive opinion. Unless she learned something last night, she is still groping in the dark. We must give her time, said the colonel. We have accomplished some good, however, continued the girl. Ingua is much happier and more content. She is improving in her speech and manners, and is growing ambitious to become a respectable and refined young lady. She doesn't often give way to temper, as she used to do on every occasion, and I am sure if she could be removed from her grandfather's evil influence, she would soon develop in a way to surprise us all. "'Does her grandfather's influence seem to be evil, then?' asked the colonel. "'He has surrounded her with privations, if not actual want,' she said. "'Only the night before this he was in such a violent rage that he tried to smash everything in the house.' That is surely an evil example to set before the child, who has a temper of her own, perhaps inherited from him. He has, however, bought her a new dress, the first one she has had in more than a year, so perhaps the old man at times relents toward his granddaughter, and tries to atone for his shortcomings. Grandpa Jim was thoughtful for a time. Perhaps, he presently remarked, Mr. Cragg has but little money to buy dresses with. I do not imagine that a man so well educated as you report him to be would prefer to live in a hovel, if he could afford anything better. "'If he is now poor, what has he done with all his money?' demanded Mary Louise. "'That is a part of the mystery, isn't it? Do you know, my dear, I can't help having a kindly thought for this poor man, perhaps because he is a grandfather and has a granddaughter, just as I have.' "'He doesn't treat her in the same way, Grandpa Jim,' said she, with a loving look toward the handsome old colonel. "'And there is a perceptible difference between Ingua and Mary Louise,' he added with a smile. They were to have Ingua's dress fitted by Miss Huckins that morning, and as Josie was fast asleep, Mary Louise went across to the cottage to go with the girl on her errand. To her surprise she found old Mr. Cragg sitting upon his little front porch, quite motionless and with his arms folded across his chest. He stared straight ahead and was evidently in deep thought. This was odd, because he was usually at his office an hour or more before this time. Mary Louise hesitated whether to advance or retreat. She had never as yet come into personal contact with Ingua's grandfather, and suspecting him of many crimes, she shrank from meeting him now. But she was herself in plain sight before she discovered his presence, and it would be fully as embarrassing to run away as to face him boldly. Moreover, through the open doorway she could see Ingua passing back and forth in the kitchen, engaged in her customary housework. So on she came. Mr. Cragg had not seemed to observe her at first, but as she now approached the porch he rose from his chair, and bowed with a courtly grace that astonished her. In many ways his dignified manner seemed to fit his colonial costume. "'You will find Ingua inside, I believe,' he said. "'I—I I am Mary Louise Burroughs,' again he bowed. "'I am glad to meet you, Miss Burroughs, and I am glad that you and Ingua are getting acquainted,' he rejoined in even, well-modulated tones. She has not many friends, and her association with you will be sure to benefit her. Mary Louise was so amazed that she fairly gasped. I—I I like Ingua, she said. We're going into town to have her new dress tried on this morning. He nodded and resumed his chair. His unexpected politeness gave her courage. It's going to be a pretty dress, she continued, and if only she had a new hat to go with it, Ingua would have a nice outfit. She needs new shoes, though, as an afterthought and perhaps a few other little things, like stockings and underwear. He was silent, 
wholly unresponsive to her suggestion. "'I—I'd I'd like to buy them for her myself,' went on the girl, in a wistful tone. "'Only Ingwa is so proud that she won't accept gifts from me.' Still he remained silent. "'I wonder,' she said, with obvious hesitation, "'if you would allow me to give you the things, sir, and then you could give them to Ingwa, as if they came from yourself.' "'No!' It was a veritable explosion, so fierce that she started back in terror. Then he rose from his chair, abruptly quitted the porch, and walked down the path toward the bridge in his accustomed, deliberate, dignified manner. Ingua, overhearing his ejaculation, came to the open window to see what had caused it. "'Oh, it's you, Mary Louise, is it?' she exclaimed. "'Thank goodness you've drove Grandad off to the office. I thought he'd planted himself in that chair for the whole day.' "'Are you ready to go to Miss Huckins?' asked Mary Louise. I will be in a few minutes. Grandad was late getting up this morning, and that put things back. He had the wakes again last night. Oh, did he walk out then? Got back at about daylight and went to bed. That's why he slept so late. Mary Louise reflected that in such a case Josie ought to have some news to tell her. She answered Ingua's inquiries after Josie by saying she was engaged this morning, and would not go to town with them. So presently the two girls set off together. Mary Louise was much better qualified to direct the makings of the dress than was Josie, and she gave Miss Huckins some hints on modern attire that somewhat astonished the country dressmaker, but were gratefully received. There was no question but that Mary Louise was stylishly, if simply dressed, on all occasions, and so Miss Huckins was glad to follow the young girl's advice. They were in the dressmaker's shop a long time, fitting and planning, and when at length they came down the stairs they saw Saul Jerram standing in his door, and closely scrutinizing, through his big horn spectacles, something he held in his hand. As Mary Louise wished to make a slight purchase at the store, she approached the proprietor, who said in a puzzled tone of voice, "'I don't know what to say to you folks, cause I'm up in the air. This money may be genuine, but it looks to me like a counterfeit.' And he held up a new ten-dollar bill. "'I want a roll of tape, please,' said Mary Louise. "'I hope your money is good, Mr. Jerms, but its value cannot interest us.' "'I don't know about that,' he replied, looking hard at Ingua. "'Old Swallertail give me this bill not ten minutes ago, and said as his granddaughter was to buy whatever she liked, as far as the money would go. That order was so queer that it made me suspicious. See here, a few days ago old Cragg bought Ingua a new dress, and paid for it by gum, and now he wants her to get ten dollars worth of shoes and things. Don't that look mighty strange?' "'Why?' asked Mary Louise. "'Cause it's the first money he's spent on the kids since I can remember, and he's always talking poverty and saying how he'll die in the poorhouse, if prices keep going up, as they have during the furrin' war that's now humming across the water. If he's that poor, and on a sudden springs a ten-dollar bill on me for fixins for his kid, there's sure something wrong somewhere. I got stuck on a bill just like this a year ago, and I ain't going to let any goods go till I find out for sure whether it's real money or not. "'When can you find out?' inquired Mary Louise. "'Tomorrow there's a drummer due here from the city, a feller keen as a razor, who'll know in a minute if the bill is counterfeit. If he says it's good, then Ingua can trade it out, but I ain't going to take no chances.' Ingua came close to the storekeeper, her face dark with passion. "'Come,' said Mary Louise, shaking the child's arm. "'Let us go home. I am sure Mr. Jerrams is over-particular, and that the money is all right. But we can wait until tomorrow easily. Come, Ingua.' The child went reluctantly, much preferring to vent her indignation on old Saul. Mary Louise tried to get her mind off the insult. "'We'll have the things all right, Ingua,' she said. "'Wasn't it splendid in your grandfather to be so generous, when he has so little money to spend? And the ten dollars will fit you up famously.' "'I wish, though,' she added, "'there was another or a better store at the crossing at which to trade.' "'Well, there ain't,' observed Ingua. "'So we have to put up with that Saul Jerrams.' When I tell Grandad about this business, I bet he'll punch Saul Jerram's nose. Don't tell him, advised Mary Louise. Why not? I think he gave this money to Mr. Jerram's on a sudden impulse. Besides, if there is any question about its being genuine, he will take it back, and you will lose the value of it. Better wait until tomorrow, when of course the drummer will pronounce it all right. My opinion is that Mr. Jerram's is so unused to new ten-dollar bills that having one makes him unjustly suspicious. "'I guess you're right,' said Ingua more cheerfully. "'It's amazing that Grandad loosened up at all, and he might repent, like you say, and take the money back. So I'll be like old Saul. I'll take no chances.'" End of chapter 18. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 19. Good Money for Bad. At luncheon Josie appeared at the table, fresh as ever, and Mary Louise began to relate to her and to her grandfather the occurrences of the morning. When she came to tell how Saul Jerrems had declared the money counterfeit, Josie suddenly sprang up and swung her napkin around her head, shouting gleefully, "'Glory, hallelujah! I've got him! I've trapped old Swallowtail at last!' They looked at her in amazement. "'What do you mean?' asked Mary Louise. Josie sobered instantly. "'Forgive me,' she said. "'I'm ashamed of myself. Go on with the story. What became of that counterfeit?' "'Mr. Jerrems has it yet.' He is keeping it to show to a commercial traveller who is to visit his store to-morrow. If the man declares the money is good, then Ingua may buy her things. "'We won't bother the commercial traveller, said Josie, in a tone of relief. "'I'm going straight down to the store to redeem that bill. I want it in my possession.' Colonel Hathaway regarded her gravely. "'I think our female detective, having said so much and having exhibited such remarkable elation, must now explain her discoveries to us more fully,' said he. "'I'd rather not just yet,' protested Josie. "'But what have I said in my madness, and what did my words imply?' "'From the little I know of this case,' replied the Colonel, "'I must judge that you believe Mr. Cragg to be a counterfeiter, "'and that his mysterious business is to counterfeit. "'In this out-of-the-way place,' he continued thoughtfully, "'such a venture might be carried on for a long time without detection. "'Yet there is one thing that to me forbids this theory.' "'What is that, sir?' A counterfeiter must of necessity have confederates, and Mr. Cragg seems quite alone in the conduct of his mysterious business. Josie smiled quite contentedly. Confederates? Last night's discoveries had proved that old Swallowtail had two of these, at least. Please don't lisp a word of this suspicion at present, she warned her friends. If I am right, and I have no doubt of that, we are about to uncover a far-reaching conspiracy to defraud the government. But the slightest hint of the danger would enable them to escape— and I want the credit of putting this gang of desperadoes behind bars. Really, I'd no idea, when I began the investigation, that it would lead to anything so important. I thought, at first, it might be a simple murder case. Simple, because the commonest people commit murder, and to the detective the deed is more revolting than exciting. But we may dismiss the murder suspicion entirely. "'Oh, indeed! What about Ned Jocelyn's mysterious disappearance?' asked Mary Louise. "'Jocelyn? He disappeared for a purpose,' answered Josie. I saw him last night, monocle and all, acting as old Cragg's confederate. Ned Jocelyn is one of those I hope to land in prison. Her hearers seemed quite bewildered by this positive statement. "'Where were you last night?' inquired Mary Louise. "'At that five acres of stone we once visited, which is Mr. Cragg's private property. Hidden somewhere in the hillside is a cavern, and in that cavern the counterfeit money is made. I have heard the printing press turning it out in quantity, I saw Ned Jocelyn come away with a package of the manufactured bills, and heard Old Swallowtail implore him to play square with the proceeds. There was another of the gang present, also, a man whom I had considered quite an innocent citizen of Cragg's Crossing, until I discovered him with the others. I think it was he who operated the press. It has been a very pretty plot, a cleverly conducted plot, and it has been in successful operation for years." but the gang is in the toils just now, and a little red-headed Josie O'Gorman is going to score a victory that will please her detective daddy mightily. Josie was surely elated when she ventured to boast in this manner. The others were duly impressed. "'You don't mean to arrest those men alone, do you, Josie?' asked the colonel, somewhat anxiously. "'No, indeed. I'm not yet quite ready to spring my trap,' she replied. "'When the time comes I must have assistance, but I want to get all my evidence ship-shape before I call on the Secret Service to make the capture.' I can't afford to bungle so important a thing, you know, and this ten-dollar bill, so carelessly given the storekeeper, is going to put one powerful bit of evidence in my hands. That was a bad slip on old Cragg's part, for he has been very cautious in covering his tracks until now. But I surmise that Mary Louise's pleading for Ingua this morning touched his pride, and having no real money at hand he ventured to give the storekeeper a counterfeit. And old Saul, having been caught by a counterfeit once before, I wonder if old Swallowtail gave him that one, too, became suspicious of the newness of the bill, and so played directly into our hands. So now, if you'll excuse me, I'll run into town without further delay. I won't rest easy until that bill is in my possession. I'll go with you, said Mary Louise eagerly. Half an hour later the two girls entered the store and found the proprietor alone. Mary Louise made a slight purchase, as an excuse, and then Josie laid ten silver dollars on the counter and said carelessly, 
"'Will you give me a ten-dollar bill for this silver, Mr. Jerrams? I want to send it away in a letter.' "'Sure. I'd rather have the change than the bill,' he answered, taking out his wallet. "'But I wouldn't send so much money in a letter if I was you. Better buy a post-office order.' "'I know my business,' she pertly replied, watching him unroll the letter wallet. "'No, don't give me that old bill. I'd rather have the new one on top.' "'That new one,' said he, "'I don't believe is good. Looks like a counterfeit to me.' "'Let's see it,' proposed Josie, taking the bill and scrutinizing it. "'I could tell a counterfeit a mile away.' "'No, this is all right. I'll take it,' she decided. "'You're like to get stung if you do,' he warned her. "'I'll take my chances,' said Josie, folding the bill and putting it in her purse. "'You've got good money for it, anyhow, so you've no kick coming that I can see.' "'Why, that must be the bill Mr. Cragg gave you,' Mary Louise said to the storekeeper, as if she had just recognized it. "'It is,' admitted Saul. "'Then Ingwa can now buy her outfit?' "'Any time she likes,' he said. "'But I want it regular understood that the sewing girl can't bring the money back to me, if she finds it bad. I ain't sure it's bad, you know, but I've warned her, and now it's her lookout.' "'Of course it is,' agreed Josie. "'But don't worry. The bill is as good as gold. I wish I had a hundred like it.' On their way home Josie stopped to call on Ingua, while Mary Louise, at her friend's request, went on. "'I've two important things to tell you,' Josie announced to the child. "'One is that you needn't worry any more about Ned Jocelyn's being dead.' A girl whom I know well has lately seen him alive and in good health, so whatever your grandfather's crimes may have been, he is not a murderer. Ingua was astounded. After a moment she gasped out, "'How do you know? Who was the girl? Are you sure it was Ned Jocelyn?' "'Quite sure. He has probably been in hiding for some reason. But you mustn't tell a soul about this, Ingua, especially your grandfather. It is part of the secret between us, and that's the reason I have told you.' Ingua still stared as if bewildered. "'Who was the girl?' she whispered. I can't tell you her name, but you may depend upon the truth of her statement just the same. And she's sure it were Ned Jocelyn she saw? Isn't he tall and thin, with a light moustache and curly hair, and doesn't he wear glass in one eye? With a string to it, yes. That's him sure enough. Where'd she see him? Don't ask me questions. That's the part of the girl's secret, you know. She let me tell you this much, so you wouldn't worry any longer over the horror of that winter night when your grandfather went to the Kenton house and Jocelyn disappeared. I think, Ingua, that the man is crooked, and mixed up with a lot of scoundrels who ought to be in jail. Ingua nodded her head. Grandad told him he was crooked, she affirmed. I don't say his grandad is a saint, Josie, but he ain't crooked like Ned. You can bank on that. Cause he's a crag, and the crags is square toes even when they're chillins. Josie smiled at this quaint speech. She was sorry for poor Ingua, whose stalwart belief in the crag honesty was doomed to utter annihilation, when her grandsire was proved to have defrauded the government by making counterfeit money. But this was no time to undeceive the child, so she said, "'The other bit of news I have is that Saul Jerrams has traded the bill which he thought was bad for good money, so you can buy your things any time you please. Then it wasn't counterfeit? I saw it myself. I've lived in the city so long that no one can fool me with counterfeit money. I can tell it in two looks, Ingua. So I'd rather have a nice new bill than ten clumsy silver dollars, and I made the trade myself.' "'Where'd you get so much money, Josie?' "'My wages. I don't do much work, but I get paid regularly once a week.' She didn't explain that her father made her a weekly allowance, but Ingua was satisfied. "'What do you think I ought to buy with that money, Josie? I need so many things that it's hard to tell where to begin and where to leave off.' "'Let's make a list, then, and figure it out.' This occupied them some time, and proved a very fascinating occupation to the poor girl, who had never before had so much money to spend at one time. "'I owe it all to Mary Louise,' she said gratefully as Josie rose to depart. "'It seems like no one can refuse Mary Louise anything. "'When she asked me to be more careful in my speech, didn't I do better? "'It slips now and then, but I'm always trying. "'And she tackled Grandad. "'If you or me or I had asked Grandad for that money, "'Josie, we'd never have got it in a thousand years. "'Why do you suppose Mary Louise gets into people the way she does?' "'It's personality, I suppose,' answered Josie thoughtfully. And then, realizing that Ingua might not understand that remark, she added, "'There's no sham about Mary Louise. She's so simple and sweet that she wins hearts without any effort. You and I have nature so positive on the contrary that we seem always on the aggressive, and that makes folks hold aloof from us or even oppose us.' "'I wish I was like Mary Louise,' said Ingua with a sigh. "'I don't,' declared Josie. "'We can't all be alike, you know, and I'd rather push ahead and get a few knocks on the way than have a clear path and no opposition.' End of chapter 19. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
twenty of Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Twenty: An Unexpected Appearance. For a week it was very quiet at Cragg's Crossing. The only ripple of excitement was caused by the purchase of Ingua's new outfit. In this, the child was ably assisted by Mary Louise and Josie. Indeed, finding the younger girl so ignorant of prices and even of her own needs. The two elder ones entered into a conspiracy with old Saul, and slyly added another ten dollars to Ingua's credit. The result was that she carried home not only shoes and a new hat, trimmed by Miss Huckins without cost, the material being furnished from the fund, but a liberal supply of underwear, ribbons, collars, and hosiery, and even a pair of silk gloves, which delighted the child's heart more than anything else. Miss Huckins's new dress proved very pretty and becoming and with all her wealth of apparel Ingua was persuaded to dine with Mary Louise at the Kenton house on a Saturday evening. The hour was set for seven o'clock, in order to allow the girl to prepare her grandfather's supper before going out, and the first intimation old Swallowtail had of the arrangement was when he entered the house Saturday evening and found Ingua arrayed in all her finery. He made no remark at first, but looked at her more than once, whether approvingly or not his stolid expression did not betray. When the girl did not sit down to the table, and he observed she had set no place for herself, he suddenly said, "'Well, I'm going to eat with the Hathaways to-night,' she replied. "'Their dinner ain't ready till seven o'clock, so if you hurry I can wash the dishes afore I go.' He offered no objection. Indeed, he said nothing at all, until he had finished his simple meal. Then, as she cleared the table, he said, "'It might be well, while you are in the society of Mary Louise and Colonel Hathaway,' to notice their method of speech, and try to imitate it. "'What's wrong with my talk?' she demanded. She was annoyed at the suggestion, because she had been earnestly trying to imitate Mary Louise's speech. "'I will leave you to make the discovery yourself,' he said dryly. She tossed her dishes into the hot water rather recklessly. "'If I ought to talk different,' she said, "'it's your fault. You hain't give me no schoolin' or nothin'. You don't even say six words a week to me. I'm just your slave, to make your bed and cook your meals and wash your dishes.' "'Gee, how do you suppose I'd talk? Like a lady?' "'I think,' he quietly responded, "'you picked up your slang from your mother, who, however, had some education. The education ruined her for the quiet life here, and she plunged into the world to get the excitement she craved. Hasn't she been sorry for it many times, Ingua?' "'I don't know much about Mom, and I don't care whether she's sorry or not. But I do know I need a education. If Mary Louise hadn't had no education, she'd been just like me, a bit of junk on a scrap heap that ain't no good to itself nor anybody else. He mused silently for a while, getting up finally and walking over to the door. Your peculiarities of expression, he then remarked, as if more to himself than to the child, are those we notice in Saul Jerrams and Joe Brennan and Mary Ann Hopper. They are a characteristic of the rural population, which, having no spur to improve its vocabulary, naturally grows degenerate in speech. She glanced at him half defiantly not sure whether he was poking fun at her or not. "'If you mean I talks country talk,' said she, "'you're right. Why shouldn't I, with no one to tell me better?' Again he mused. His mood was gentle this evening. "'I realize I have neglected you,' he presently said. "'You were thrust upon me like a stray kitten, which one does not want but cannot well reject. Your mother has not supplied me with money for your education, although she has regularly paid for your keep.' "'She has!' cried Ingua, astounded. "'Then you've swindled her and me both, for I pays more'n my keep in hard work. "'My keep? For the love of Mike, what does my keep amount to? A cent a year?' He winced a little at her sarcasm, but soon collected himself. Strangely enough, he did not appear to be angry with her. "'I've neglected you,' he repeated, "'but it has been an oversight. I have so much on my mind that I scarcely realized you were here. I forgot you are Nan's child and that you—you you needed attention.' Ingua put on her new hat, looking into a cracked mirror. "'You might have remembered I'm a crag, anyhow,' she said, mollified by his tone of self-reproach. "'And you might have remembered as you're a crag. The crags are to help each other, cause all the world's agin em. He gave her an odd look, in which pride, perplexity, and astonishment mingled. "'And you're going into the enemy's camp tonight? "'Oh, Mary Louise is all right. She ain't like them other snippy girls that sometimes comes here to the big houses. She don't care if I'm a crag or if I talks country.' I like Mary Louise. When she had gone, the old man sat in deep thought for a long time. The summer evening cast shadows. Twilight fell. Darkness gradually shrouded the bare little room. 
Still he sat in his chair, staring straight ahead into the gloom and thinking. Then the door opened. Shifting his eyes he discovered a dim shadow in the opening. Whoever it was stood motionless until a low, clear voice asked sharply, "'Anybody home?' He got up then, and shuffled to a shelf, where he felt for a kerosene lamp and lighted it. "'Come in, Nan,' he said, without turning around, as he stooped over the lamp and adjusted the wick. The yellow light showed a young woman, standing on the doorway, a woman of perhaps thirty-five. She was tall, erect, her features well formed, her eyes bright and searching. Her walking suit was neat and modish, and fitted well her graceful, rounded form. On her arm was a huge basket, which she placed upon a chair as she advanced into the room and closed the door behind her. "'So you've come back,' remarked old Swallowtail, standing before her and regarding her critically. "'A self-evident fact, Dad,' she answered lightly, removing her hat. "'Where's Ingwa?' "'At a dinner-party across the river.' "'That's good. Is she well?' "'What do you care, Nan, whether she is well or not?' "'If she's at a dinner-party, I needn't worry. Forgive the foolish question, Dad. Brennan promised to bring my suitcase over in the morning. I lugged the basket myself.' "'What's in the basket?' "'Food. Unless you've changed your mode of living, the cupboard's pretty bare, and this is Saturday night. I can sleep on that heart-breaking husk mattress with Ingwa, but I'll be skinned if I eat your salt junk and corn-pone. Forewarned is forearmed. I brought my own grub.' As she spoke she hung her hat and coat on some pegs, turned the lamp a little higher, and then, pausing with hands on hips, she looked inquisitively at her father. "'You seem pretty husky for your age,' she continued, with a hard little laugh. "'You've been prospering, Nan.' "'Yes,' sitting in a chair and crossing her legs. "'I've found my forte at last. For three years nearly I've been employed by the Secret Service Department at Washington.' "'Ah! I've made good. My record as a woman sleuth is excellent.' I make more money in a week, when I'm working, than you do in a year. Unless—' She paused abruptly and gave him a queer look. "'Unless it's true that you're coining money in a way that's not legal.' He stood motionless before her, reading her face. She returned his scrutiny with interest. Neither resumed the conversation for a time. Finally the old man sank back into his chair. "'A female detective,' said he, a little bitterly, "'is still a female. And likewise a detective.' "'I know more about you, Dad, than you think,' she asserted, in an easy, composed tone that seemed impossible to disturb. "'You need looking after, just at this juncture, and as I've been granted a vacation I ran up here to look after you.' "'In what way, Nan?' "'We'll talk that over later. There isn't much love lost between us, more's the pity. You've always thought more of your infernal cause than your daughter. But we're crags, both of us, and it's the crag custom to stand by the family.' It struck him as curious that Ingwa had repeated almost those very words earlier that same evening. He had never taught them the crag motto, Stand Fast, that he could remember, yet both Nan and her child were loyal to the code. Was he loyal, too? Had he stood by Nan in the past and Ingwa in the present, as a crag should do? His face was a bit haggard as he sat in his chair and faced his frank-spoken daughter, whose clear eyes did not waver before his questioning gaze. "'I know what you're thinking,' said she that I've never been much of a daughter to you. Well, neither have you been much of a father to me. Ever since I was born and my unknown mother, lucky soul, died, you've been obsessed by an idea which, lofty and altruistic as you might have considered it, has rendered you self-centered, cold and inconsiderate of your own flesh and blood. Then there's that devilish temper of yours to contend with. I couldn't stand the life here. I wandered away, and goodness knows how I managed to live year after year in a struggle with the world, rather than endure your society and the hardships you thrust upon me. You've always had money, yet not a cent would you devote to your family. You lived like a dog and wanted me to do the same, and I wouldn't. Finally I met a good man and married him. He wasn't rich, but he was generous. When he died I was thrown on my own resources again, with a child of my own to look after. Circumstances forced me to leave Ingwa with you while I hunted for work. I found it. I'm a detective, well known and respected in my profession." "'I'm glad to know you're prosperous,' he said gently, as she paused. He made no excuses. He did not contradict her accusations. He waited to hear her out. "'So,' said Nan, in a careless off-hand tone, "'I've come here to save you. You're in trouble.' "'I'm not aware of it.' "'Very true. If you were, the danger would be less. I've always had to guess at most of your secret life. I knew you were sly and secretive. I didn't know until now that you've been crooked.' He frowned a little, but made no retort. 
"'It doesn't surprise me, however,' she continued. "'A good many folks are crooked at times, and the only wonder is that a clever man like you has tripped and allowed himself to fall under suspicion. Suspicion leads to investigation, when it's followed up, and investigation in such cases leads to jail.' He gave a low growl that sounded like the cry of an enraged beast, and gripped the arms of his chair fiercely. Then he rose and paced the room with frantic energy. Nan watched him with half a smile on her face. When he had finally mastered his wrath and became more quiet, she said, "'Don't worry, Dad. I said I have come to save you. It will be fun after working for the government for so long to work against it. There's a certain red-headed imp in this neighborhood who is the daughter of our assistant chief, John O'Gorman. Her name is Josie O'Gorman, and she's in training for the same profession of which I'm an ornament. I won't sneer at her, for she's clever in a way, but I'd like to show O'Gorman that Nan Shelley, that's my name in Washington, is a little more clever than his pet. This Josie O'Gorman is staying with the Hathaway family. She's been probing your secret life and business enterprises, and has unearthed an important clue in which the department is bound to be interested. So she sent a code telegram to O'Gorman, who left it on his desk long enough for me to decipher and read it. I don't know what the assistant chief will do about it, for I left Washington an hour later and came straight to you. What I do know is that I am in time to spike Miss Josie's guns, which will give me a great deal of pleasure. She doesn't know I'm your daughter, any more than O'Gorman does, so if the girl sees me here she'll imagine I'm on government business. I want to keep out of her way for a time. Do you know the girl, Dad? Yes, he said. She's rather clever. Yes. I think she'd have nabbed you presently, if I hadn't taken hold of the case so promptly myself. With our start, and the exercise of a grain of intelligence, we can baffle any opposition the girl can bring to bear. Do you wish to run away? No, he growled. I'm glad of that. I like the excitement of facing danger boldly. But there's ample time to talk over details. I see you've had your supper, so I'll just fry myself a beefsteak. She opened her basket and began to prepare a meal. Old Swallowtail sat and watched her. Presently he smiled grimly, and Nan never noticed the expression. Perhaps, had she done so, she would have demanded an explanation. He rarely smiled, and certainly his daughter's disclosures were not calculated to excite mirth, or even to amuse. End of chapter 20 Read by Sibella Denton For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.